Good morning, church. God is good. Before I go into my message, I just wanted to take a moment just to praise God for just the amazing things he's been doing lately, right? For our dear sister um, wanting to take water baptism, praise God for that. Um, And then also for uh, just the many amazing testimonies we heard from camp um, this last weekend. Fortunately, I couldn't make it because I was out of town, but I heard many amazing testimonies of young people giving their lives to the Lord. Many young people confessing sins to one another. Many young people just understanding that there is no other way in this life other than through Christ. So praise God for that. The passage I'll be reading from today is Romans 5, verses 18 through 21. And we'll kind of go around Romans a little bit, but we'll start here. So Romans 5, verses 18 to 21. Therefore, as one trespass led to condemnation for all men, so one act of righteousness leads to justification and life for all men. For as by the one man's disobedience the many were made sinners, so by the one man's obedience the many will be made righteous. Now the law came in to increase the trespass, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more, so that as sin reigned in death, Grace also might reign through righteousness, leading to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen? Amen. So this is a familiar passage to to many of us. The concept of Adam making that first trespass and then Jesus making that act of righteousness that saved us, right? And so the title of this message is Living in Sin or Living in Christ. So we can either be in sin, in sin in the first Adam, or we can be in Christ, which is the last Adam. There is no in between, right? And what I mean by that is you can either actively pursue sin and forsake Christ, or you can actively forsake sin, ask the Holy Spirit to help you as you pursue Christ. And as many of us in this church know, any follower, any believer of Christ, we go through this season, right? But we we try to justify our sins. We try to play God and we allow ourselves to coexist with sin while attempting to live a life pleasing to God. But we know that there is only one or the other, right? And so often we try to find this balance saying, maybe I can do this and I can repent later. Maybe I can do this and I can say, God covers me in grace. But we cannot coexist with sin while trying to follow God. And we know that the spirit and the flesh are warring against each other, right? It's amazing, but we can, we can procrastinate so much, whether it's for uh, an assignment or whether it's for some kind of um, project at work, whatever it might be. We, we all procrastinate sometimes, right? But all of a sudden, when a big grade or a job is on the line, we're going to get it done, right? I guess I'm the only one. <laughs> Yet when our eternity is on the line, we don't quite get to it as fast as other things that we might do. And maybe it's because we don't quite see a deadline in front of us and we feel that we can push it off. And I think just as humans, we want evidence of everything, right? Even if we believe something, we still want to see it or hear it or feel it. We want proof, right? Right? For example, what's the first thing we say when a friend says he gets a a new car or a new video game or a new clothing item, whatever it might be? What's the first thing we might say? We say, no way, let me see it. And doesn't, again, doesn't mean that we're not believing our friend when they tell us that, but for whatever reason, taking their word at face value is not enough for us. We want to see it. Or maybe you tell a friend, You'll never believe who just called me and left a voicemail. No way. Let me hear it. And church, that's why this journey can be so difficult without faith. 
We are operating in a spiritual realm that is uncommon to this world and it's foreign to our flesh. And so when we only choose to live in the flesh, that's when we find that sin is going to try to deceive us. When we choose to justify our sins rather than crucify them, we allow sin to deceive us and bend the rules. So as it talks about Romans 5, verse 20 that we just read, now the law came in to increase or expand the awareness of sin, but where sin increased, grace abounded all the more. The NLT version says, God's law was given so that all people could see how sinful they were. But as people sinned more and more, God's wonderful grace became more abundant. So with that law that it talks about in verse 20, we know that even now as we're living now, a law is binding, right? And normally, you're not released from that law until death or some other kind of circumstance. And so Paul talks about that a little bit in uh, Romans 7. We're not going to read all of it, but we see in those first couple of verses, uh, in verse 6, it says... But now we are released from the law, having died to that which held us captive, so that we serve in the new way of the Spirit and not in the old way of written code. So we are released from the law. Just as if a spouse dies, you're released from the law of marriage, and you are allowed to pursue someone else. But it's the same thing here. Christ's death on the cross has released us from the law, and Now we're free. And we're able to serve in the new way of the spirit. But if we fall back into sin, we try to deceive ourselves. We try to justify our sin. So then what? When you try to justify yourself, when you try to defend yourself, you start looking for every reason, every avenue to try to put the blame somewhere else. And so Paul talks about that as well into the next section of chapter 7 where it says the law in sin. Verses 7 through 9, it says, What then shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet if it not had been for the law, I would not have known sin. For I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had said, You shall not covet. But sin, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, produced in me, All kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin came alive and I died. I don't know about you guys, but when I first read this passage, it's just so crazy that Paul, a power character in the Bible, he's saying that he went through this too. He was struggling too. That sin came alive, and it deceived him, and it killed him. And so the way I think about it, when I first read it, I, I, the context I was putting in my head was, you know, I could be driving down the road going 45, perfectly happy. The road is completely empty. Then all of a sudden I see the speed limit is 55, and then I start thinking, I guess I can go faster. I was perfectly happy where I was going 45, and then the speed limit says 55, and then I say... I can go five over, I'll be okay. Not a big deal, but I still broke the law, right? And so I wanted to put it into a little bit more context and kind of make it a little bit more understandable, especially for the younger people. Um, But has anyone heard of the, the cookie challenge where you put a cookie in front of your kid and then you say, don't eat this cookie, I'm gonna be right back. And then you record to see what they do. Has anyone seen that? Okay, if not, we have an example right here. We'll show that.
<laughs> All right, can we give a, give a hand for Alora? Thank you, Finney and Havila, for allowing her to be part of that. So, I feel like that's such a clear example of what we do, right? And so actually, when I told them to do the video, I was kind of hoping she would fail and eat the cookie because that's when it's most funny. Um, and that's when the challenge is, you know, that's the whole point of it. But she did a good job. Let's give a hand for Laura. That's, you did a good job. May you get more and more cookies. So yeah, I was hoping she would mess up there and then, you know, it'd, be, it'd make for a better video. But she did great. And that's what we should be doing, right? So once she heard her mom say, wait, you see the battle begin. You see that internal struggle in her. She's tapping her fingers on the plate. She's putting her hand on her head. And the funniest part to me is when she like hits her head and she's really struggling. It's the moment that her mom says, wait, wait for me to come back and then you can have the cookie. But all of a sudden the first thoughts start to come, even at such a young age, right? The first thoughts start to come in her head. Maybe I can just eat the cookie now. Mom and dad will still love me. But it's the same thing that we do. Again, reading that verse, for I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet. But sin, seizing the opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. And then we go a little bit further. Romans 7, verse 10 to 12. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me. For sin, seizing an opportunity, again, through the commandment, deceived me, and through it, killed me. So the law is holy, and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. We're going we're gonna to come back to that. So just as we read in the beginning, as one trespass in the first Adam led to condemnation for all men, one act of righteousness in the last Adam leads to justification and life for all men. Amen? So we're going to visit that story. Genesis 3. Can we all turn to Genesis 3? I know it's a sad story. So, here's a story of sin deceiving a character in the Bible, right? So we all know this, Genesis 3, and we'll start a little bit earlier on Genesis 2. So it's talking about, you know, God makes Adam, he makes Eve. Um, chapter 2, verse 9, says, Out of the ground the Lord God made to spring up every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life was in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And then jump to verse 17. Actually, we'll go to 16. The Lord God commanded the man, saying, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So, we're going to start to see so many comparisons between the Romans passage that we read and this Genesis passage. So Romans 7 verse 11, it says, For sin, again, seizing an opportunity through the commandment, it deceived me, and through it, it killed me. The word that stood out to me, deceived. And what do we see about the serpent? Genesis 3 verse 1, he was more crafty than any other beast of the field. Genesis 3 verse 13, the serpent deceived me, and I ate. So church, we know what happens next. What, what, does, what happens? They eat the fruit, and they essentially sign their death sentence, right? So Romans 7 verse 5, it talks about bearing fruit for death. While we were living in the flesh, our sinful passions aroused by the law were at work in our members to bear fruit for death. And then verse 13 says, Did that which is good then bring death to me? By no means it was sin producing death in me through what is good. And we see the same thing here. God says, 
Every tree I have given you that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. Yet they disobey, they let sin deceive them from the law that God gave. And that fruit that was initially meant to be good for them, it produced death in them instead. So now we go to Genesis 3 towards the end of the passage. What happens? Verse 24, he drove out the man at the east of the Garden of Eden. He placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. So at this point, they are tossed out of the garden. And all should have been lost and over, right? I still have to ask God this all the time when I'm in my, just my own personal devotion with the Lord. All should have been lost and over, yet... God, you're so gracious and so merciful that he would give his only son to die on a tree for us. And there's so much to actually unpack in these one or two verses, but we don't have the time for that, and I don't think I'm smart enough to fully unpack all that. But, wow. Hello. Okay, wow. I feel like the the tone of the message just changed. But Zechariah 13, verse 7, it says, Awake, O sword, against my shepherd, against the man who stands next to me, declares the Lord of hosts. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered. So we see Adam and Eve, they mess up. They are taken out of the garden. There's a flaming sword that is guarding every way to the tree of life. And yet we see... That this is prophetical. In in Zechariah, it says that same sword is going to be striking Jesus. And we actually see Jesus quote this directly. In Matthew 26, verse 31, right before Peter's going to deny him and he's foretelling that, Jesus says to them, You will all fall away because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. So just a quick recap. Our sin caused us to lose access to the Father and to eternal life. Yet Jesus took that sword of justice. He took it upon himself, and because of his death on the cross, we have life. Amen? And it gets better. As it says in Revelations 2, To him that overcomes, or to him that is victorious, I will give to eat the tree of life, which is in the middle of the paradise of God. And that same tree, in Revelation 22, it says that tree will be healing for the nations. Amen? So how powerful that Jesus would take our sin, our shame, our disgusting filth, He would take that sword upon himself that was guarding the tree of life, yet he would die on a tree for us that we might have eternal life, that he might glorify the Father. So going back to this idea of the law that we've been talking about. Laws should be reflective of the lawmakers, right? And we see that. Romans, again, Romans 7, verse 12. The law is holy. The commandment is holy and righteous and good. Do we not serve a holy and righteous and good God? And it's the same reason we get upset with police officers or or politicians or anyone that is, you know, above the law in a sense. And we get upset if they break or abuse their power. Yet Jesus followed every law, committed no sin, Right? And again, as we know, Christ came not to abolish, but to fulfill the law. So we saw the law as an opportunity to sin, as a license to sin. God gives us his spirit and his son and gives us an opportunity to join with him. And I don't know who needs to hear this, but at one point or another... You will need accountability. At one point or another, you will need Christ-centered community. But at all times, we need Jesus. Amen. As it says in Philippians, to live is Christ 
and to die is gain. And for us to live, the spirit must live in us. And our flesh must die. And as mentioned earlier, when we try to justify our sins, we try to put blame everywhere else other than ourselves, right? But instead of looking for somewhere or someone to blame, like Adam blamed Eve and like Eve blamed the serpent, we have to change the narrative. We have to understand that your suffering is not because of Christ, but it is for Christ. Everyone here is going to go through suffering. You already have gone through suffering or you will go through suffering. But so often we make our suffering about me, me, me. We say, how can this happen to me? We have to change that narrative. Ask God to cleanse our heart to know that the suffering is not because of Christ, but it is for Christ. And know that your suffering will lead you to Christ. And really, as I was preparing this message, I felt that the heart of my message is for the believer who feels like they are so stuck in sin and that there is no way out. Here's the answer. Christ. Christ is the answer. Christ is the lifeline. Christ is the living hope. Praise God that he uses such sinful vessels like us to pour his grace into that we may have eternal life through him. And it's the story of redemption, the story of the gospel that we hear every day, maybe, every week. We hear from a young age, and sometimes it goes in one ear and out the other. And I don't know if it's just the season I'm in, but I'm constantly having to remind myself because it's so easy to get jaded, so easy to act like I already know the gospel. That's why every time I'm up here exhorting, I'm trying to pray to God, plead to God, saying, don't let the gospel go in one ear and out the other. So Romans, back to Romans, uh, we're going to go to 6. So again, this is a message of grace. But there is a penalty for the wages of sin. Christ paid that on the cross, but if we choose to ignore that and we continue in sin... Then again, just like Adam and Eve, we've signed a death sentence. Because again, we must be dead to sin. We must be alive to God in Christ Jesus. We must be dead to sin. We cannot follow the first Adam. We have to be in Christ, the last Adam, because there's no in-between. We must actively forsake sin and pursue Christ. It's not always easy. And this is the message that I feel that many churches are trying to skew. It's that prosperity message saying, if you join Christ, everything's going to be so easy. But me, Joel, Sajin, uh, Jesswin, and Chris, we were talking about this yesterday, but it's not always easy, but it is the right choice. It's a beautiful choice to follow after Christ, knowing that, again, our suffering is for Christ, and it's leading us to Christ. So in Romans 6, it says, what shall we say then? So we just heard about all of this stuff with, with one trespass leading to condemnation and Jesus' act of righteousness leading to justification in life. We heard about how if we turn away from that, we start to try to put the blame on something else. We try to say, maybe it's the law that made me sin. Maybe it's God putting this in front of me that made me sin. We try to think of all these reasons. And we know that we are covered by grace. We are saved by grace. But here it is, Romans 6. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? By no means. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, 
in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in the newness of life. And as it says in verse 11, so you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Again, there is no in-between, church. And that's me. I am standing up here as a sinner saved by grace. Preaching to other sinners saved by grace. Because we have been saved by a blessed Savior. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up here. As it says in Hebrews 12, verses 2, Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and who is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. That same Jesus who put the blame on himself, who took all of our sin, all of our filth, all of our dirtiness, he is now seated at the right hand of the throne of God. So church, can we bow our heads? Again, as I said, the heart of my message, I felt was for the the believer who feels like they are wallowing in their sin, who feels like no matter what, they are stuck in this repetitive cycle of sin, repent, sin, repent, sin, repent, and they feel like there is no way out. My prayer is that they see that the way out is Christ, that he has given us the word of God that he has placed his spirit in us and that rather than being in sin, that we would be in Jesus Christ. So church, can we actually hold hands with those who are next to you? We're going to go into the time of worship, but before that, I just want us to hold hands with those who are next to you. I want us to pray, earnestly pray and intercede for those who feel like they are so lost in their sin. Church, it could be the person sitting next to you. It could be you, whatever it might be. Can we earnestly pray to the Father that he would open up our spiritual eyes to see the King of glory, that we might see Jesus seated at the right hand of the throne of God. Can we begin to pray, church? Can we begin to intercede for those who are lost? Our brothers and sisters who feel like there's no way out. They could be sitting in this very church. They could be your coworkers. They could be your classmates. They could be your own family members. So, Lord, we come to you. We thank you so much for this word that you've given us. We thank you so much, Lord, for your death on the cross. And we know that there are brothers and sisters that are hurting right now. We know that there are brothers and sisters who feel like they are titled by their sin, who feel like their identity is sin. But Jesus, I thank you, Lord, that in this redemptive story that you have taught us, God, that there is grace and mercy abounding in the arms of the Father. That no matter how far we have gone, God will go farther to bring you back to the fold. And every tear that may have been cried, God knows each tear. Just as it says, Psalms 56, you keep track of all of my sorrows. All my tears are kept in your bottle. You've recorded each one in your book. So Lord, I thank you that you love us when we don't deserve it. That you show us love and mercy and grace every single day, God. 
that even though in our sin we are like pigs in the mud, you took that mud upon yourself, Lord. You took that filth upon yourself, Lord. How can we ever deserve it? Thank you, Lord, that you are our lifeline. You are the way out of sin. You are the light of which we must come out of the darkness. So Holy Spirit, I pray that you would reveal to each of us as we are interceding for brothers and sisters who feel like they are lost in sin, whether they are here right now, whether they're watching on the live stream, whether they are people that we meet throughout the week, Lord, would you reveal in our hearts who we need to reach out to? Would you reveal the people that need to hear the good news, God? And in this journey, Lord, would you help us, God, to be dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus? We ask of all this in your name. Amen.